I'm preaching today about fools. It may seem like an unusual subject, but this song, I've been a fool in my life. I've been foolish. And this song says, Mirror, don't reflect the man I used to be. changes that he made when he came in starting down the road of life i couldn't see the pain and strife that wiser men had told me lay ahead i pictured pretty rainbows ends with pots of gold in each of them and face the future without fear or dread. But the fields of clover came and went, and though in quite a few I slept, the dreams I had just never came to be. And soon behind a veil of tears, the visions of my younger years we're slowly fading from reality. Searching now in desperation, longing for the realization of the dreams I had cherished in my mind. A satisfaction for my soul, a power that could make me whole, and these were things I knew that I must find. But no one seemed to know the answers to the questions I was asking. Several gave me their philosophy. Oh, but nothing helped to ease the pain or made my future bright again. Till I heard how Jesus died for me. Life was like a looking glass, reflecting failures of the past, memories that I could not erase. Years of bitterness and strife, scars of sin upon my life, and all of these were mirrored in my face. Oh, but that's when Jesus came and found me. And he threw his loving arms around me. Gave me life and more abundantly. Oh, and now the mirror of my face reflects the glories of his grace. I'm born again to live eternally oh mirror don't reflect the man i used to be don't reveal the failure that i've been just focus on the new life christ has given me and the changes that he made when he came in. Oh, mirror, don't reflect the man I used to be. And don't reveal the failure that I've been. Focus on the new life Christ has given me. And all the changes that he made when he came in focus on the new life christ has given me and the changes that he made when he came in all the changes that he made when he came in mm, and the changes that he made when he came 
mentioned just before we sang the song that I was preaching today about fools. Now that may seem to be an unusual sermon title, but the fact is the Bible has much to say about fools and foolishness. I really want you to listen closely today. I'm going to read a text from Proverbs chapter 26 verses 1 through 12, listen to this. As snow in summer and as rain in harvest, <clears throat> so honor is not seemly or proper for a fool. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless does not come. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the fool's back. Now listen to these next two verses. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. He that sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off the feet and drinks damage. The legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. Are you folks coming in? Are you aware of the children's ministry going on downstairs? Okay. Let me read number seven again. The legs of the lame are not equal, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. As he that binds a stone in a sling, so is he that gives honor to a fool. Bind a stone in a sling. You don't bind it there, you place it there, so when you release it, it goes. If you bind it there, it doesn't go anywhere. He says, as he that binds a stone in a sling, which would be a stupid thing to do, so is he that gives honor to a fool. As a thorn goes up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. The great God that formed all things both rewards the fool and rewards transgressors. As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit, there is more hope of a fool than of him. As I said, we're preaching today on fools. Father, I pray that your word will come alive within us. Help us learn, Lord, how we should respond, how we should react, how we should deal with, how we should, Father, even check our own hearts to make sure we are not acting the fool or being foolish in some of the things we do. Help us learn today from your word, from the wisdom of your word, and make it real to us by your Holy Spirit for our own lives, Father. There may be things we need to change in how we're dealing with people in our own lives today. And I just ask these things in Jesus' name for your kingdom's sake, and for your glory, Father, because we are your people and we want to please you in everything we do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now before we deal with the subject of fools today, let me address what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Jesus gave this warning. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Mm. Jesus made that statement in the context 
of attacking people with words that come from unresolved issues of our hearts. Look at the whole passage. This is Matthew chapter 5. I'll start with verse 21. We'll go through 24. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother raka if you read that in the amplified bible it says raka means you empty-headed idiot whosoever shall say to his brother raka shall be in danger of the council but this is jesus speaking Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So we understand that to call a person a fool can be a spiritually dangerous thing to do. Nevertheless, we know that there are people in this world who are fools, who act as a fool, who do foolish things. Haven't we all done that? And it is important that we know how to deal with them in our day-to-day -day life and how to respond to them. <clears throat> Pardon me. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do you, can I remind you of uh, verses 4 and 5 of our text? It says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And then 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So it says don't, then it says do. So we need the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit in how to respond to people that we feel are doing foolish things. And I, I just want to give you a couple of things here. The Bible's very specific. I'm going to read four or five verses real quick. A whole bunch of them out of Proverbs. And in Psalms 2, the, the, it identifies how a fool acts, what they do, how they think. And it clearly identifies them. Listen to this. In Psalm 14, 1, and again in Psalm 53, 1, the psalmist says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Hmm. Romans 1.22 echoes that in the same context. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Hmm. Proverbs 10.23 says, It is as sport to a fool to do mischief. Is this bringing up any pictures of things going on in our society these days in your minds? Let me give you a few more. Proverbs 13, 9 says, It is abomination to fools to depart from evil. That's the worst thing you could do is to depart from evil. Huh. Proverbs 14, 9 says, Fools make a mock at sin. Proverbs 14, 16 says, A wise man fears and departs from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. Mm. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, tell the story of a very rich man that God called a fool because he never made preparation for eternity. Let me read it to you. Most of you know it, but hear it. And he spake a parable, this is Jesus, he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all 
my fruits, and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, <clears throat> Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And Jesus says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich, <clears throat> pardon me, toward God. Did you hear what he said? He said, There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. There's something for us to learn here because our life is based on the concept of sowing and reaping. Every day, we do something that is going to affect our future. It could be something for our financial. It could be something if you're investing in your kids, trying to spend time with them, going out and playing sports with them, attending their games, helping them with their schoolwork. You're sowing and there will be a reaping. It could be in your marital relationship that you're trying to sow good seed. But in every area of our life, not just financial, there is this concept of sowing and reaping. This man said, I've got so much, I don't need to sow anymore. Guess what happens if you don't sow? There's no hope for a harvest. There's no reaping. Thank you, brother. That's right. Unless you sow, unless you're putting in, there's no hope of a harvest. God says, you fool. All these years, I have blessed you on a principle. You have sowed and you have reaped. And now, you're saying, I'm just going to live on the blessings of yesterday. Are you hearing me, folks? I'm just going to live on the good stuff I did yesteryear. No more sowing. And God says, this night, your soul is required of you. Then what's going to happen to all those things you think are going to sustain you? And Jesus concludes by saying, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God, I know many, many people in this world that are laying up treasure for themselves and they are not rich toward God. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be me. I want to encourage every believer to do a Bible word study on the nature and the action, actions of fools. Why would I do that? It's very easy. Just go to your concordance and look up the word fool, and it'll take you to all the scriptures, fool or fools, foolish. But there's two reasons why I'm suggesting that every believer should do that, and I have done it in my own life. One is so you can recognize a fool when you meet them and respond with wisdom, or no, not to respond, right? What's it say? Don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest you, you be like unto him. Do answer a fool because, how did it read exactly? Lest he be wise in his own conceit. There's a time to answer. There's a time to just walk away. Let me read to you uh, let me tell you, I was going to tell you two reasons why I want you to do a word study. One, so you know how to respond and react to people who are being foolish and doing foolish things and acting like a fool. And the second one, so you will recognize yourself if you are one or are acting like one. You know why I sang that song? this morning that I did mirror don't reflect the man I used to be because I've done many foolish things in my life. I have compromised my relationship with God as a boy. 
I have listened and yielded to temptations. I'm glad to say that part of my prayer now, every day and throughout the day, is, Father, I want everything I think, see, say, and do to be pleasing in your sight. And that's how I live my life now. But yeah, I don't want to remember all the ways that I was a fool for not obeying the Word of God, for trying it my way, for intentionally failing, and then having to repent with bitter tears. So, first, we want to know how to recognize a person who is acting like a fool and how to respond to them. And secondly, we need to see it in ourselves if we're doing it. Amen? Thank you for the weak amen. <laughs> <clears throat> There you go. That was stronger. I'm going to read you a long passage of Scripture. It's going to take me a while to read it. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. This is 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 1 through 39. I'm reading it out of the NIV because it has less of the old King James wording and more of just our vernacular for today. Here it is. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. A certain man in Maon, <clears throat> who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats, and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. Remember those two names. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, Nabal, was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where. David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, Each of you, strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped his on as well. About 400 men. Think about it. About 400 men went up with David, <clears throat> while 200 stayed with the supplies. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. <clears throat> Pardon me. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, 
They were a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five siahs of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins and two hundred cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing, he has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. <clears throat> when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool. How many of you already knew that? Yeah, <clears throat> that's what Nabal means. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. Please, forgive your servant's presumption. <clears throat> the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles. And no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life. Why was David living out in the middle of nowhere? Because Saul was chasing him around, trying to kill him, and had all the armies that David used to lead now chasing David, trying to kill him. But now listen to how prophetic this gal is. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised him concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. What does the Bible say about vengeance? Who does it belong to? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success, remember your servant. Now listen to what David says to her. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet, you, uh, meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise... As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. 
Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. Sounds like a king already talking, doesn't it? <clears throat> when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. In other words, he probably had a stroke or got a coma or something. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord, who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. Well, we see very clearly, don't we, the difference between foolishness and wisdom. Abigail was not only a beautiful woman, she was a wise woman. She saved Nabal and all of his properties and his servants from the wrath of an angry David. But she not only saved Nabal, she saved David from doing something, as she said, the staggering burden you would carry for having avenged yourself. This is why the Bible says to those who are wise, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. We just saw it right here. David didn't have to do it. He shouldn't have done it. He didn't do it. Because Abigail brought wisdom that exceeded Nabal's folly. And God repaid Nabal. And David rejoiced that God did it. And he didn't have to do it. Did you get it? It's pretty powerful stuff. I love what I read in this story about not avenging ourselves. Because when people, even in their foolishness or their folly, do things to us. Maybe they refer to us in a negative or demeaning manner. Maybe they said something to the boss and it caused us, we think, not to get the promotion or the advancement because they just don't like us. Maybe they attacked us or said something to our face that was just not true. I've had that happen to me many times in my life. <clears throat> and I can also tell you that sometimes years later, years later, those same people found me and said, I am so sorry for what I said. I had to dismiss it. I had to forgive it. I had to let it go. If you do not forgive your brother their trespasses, Jesus said, Neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. He taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the first thing he said when what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is really more the disciples' prayer, but the point is, when it ended, the first thing he went back to was, if you don't forgive your brother, Neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Do you think God was just kidding? I think it's very important today as we look at the concept of not being a fool that we heed the word of God. We do what it says. I want to tell you that I used to hold stuff against people. God began to deal with me about this. And I cannot think of a single person in the whole world, whether you go back to grade school or whatever, that I have not forgiven. 
I ask God, if there's anybody there, show it to me, Lord. I will forgive them because I need you to forgive me my trespasses. Because I, being a pastor, trying to live right, trying to do what's right, am not perfect. I know that surprises some of you. You didn't even laugh. <clears throat> well, two people laughed. No, I am far from perfect. I still fail. I still go to the Lord and say, Father, I'm so sorry. I just wasted my day yesterday. I could have been in your presence. But the mirror of my face does not reflect the man I used to be. And I don't want to be a phony or a hypocrite up here preaching to you and not living what I'm preaching not obeying the Word of God. I want to be genuine. I want to be real, and God knows that's true. And I want to tell you something today, and I'm going to close with this. Just as God dealt with Nabal, He will deal with the fools in your life. If you and I will back off and let Him. Did you hear me? I said, he will deal with the fools just like he did with Nabal if you and I will back off and let him. I can't tell you, the, the list would just go on and on, the number of circumstances and situations in my life that God has reversed, that he has turned around. I had to forgive and forget and let it go. Sometimes it cost me money. Sometimes it cost me uh, my reputation because things were being said that weren't true. But God deals with people's hearts. God knows how to do what we don't know how to do. If we're going to answer a fool lest he be wise in his own conceit, we must try to do it in love. <clears throat> we must try to do it as one who cares about this person and <clears throat> the fact that we see that they are making a mistake, <clears throat> going the wrong way, doing something that won't turn out good for them. If we're angry, he says, don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like unto him. The Bible says not to let the sun go down on your wrath. Be angry and sin not. You know these verses. We must listen to the word of God today in all these areas. Let's not be fools. Let's not act foolishly, speak foolishly. But let us pray that God will give us wisdom. That God will give us an appropriate response at the appropriate time if there is to be a response. And if there is not to be, to help us to walk away and forgive. Father, I'm asking you in Jesus' name to deal with the hearts of everyone here, including me and all those who hear this message online, Lord. I pray, God, that we will not be fools, but we will be wise wise with the wisdom that is from above. Your word says that it is peaceable and gentle and easily entreated. Father God, let that be us. Deal with the anger sometimes we feel in our hearts and our quick, hasty responses. We don't want to be a fool. We don't want to act like a fool or talk like a fool. We want to be wise. We want Jesus to live in us. When he was persecuted, he persecuted not again. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Father God, bring this message home to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I ask it all in the name of Jesus that we may be changed, transformed by the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.